Okay, we are going to um, basically just do some exploration of uh, R's uh, functionality or some R packages functionality for working with spatial data. This is not intended to be a full course on working spatial working with spatial data in R. It's more just to give you an idea, so, uh, a few tools that are very handy, and uh, a few of which we'll probably be using uh, throughout the course here. Um, the focus of this course is actually on the ENM tools hypothesis tests and some of the stuff there. Um, not so much the basic GIS stuff. So this is just really uh, just kind of a way to maybe refresh your memory if you're already familiar with this stuff and maybe show you uh, a few new tricks if we're lucky. So first off, since we're going to be exploring a lot of functionality here, we're going to be loading a lot of packages. So if you don't have these, you'll want to install them. We need raster, uh, we need RGOS. We need ggplot2. We need Viridis. SP. Uh, Plotly. I can't actually remember if we're doing anything with Plotly in this. Whoops. Plotly. Um, okay. uh, leaflet, which we're going to use a lot. Uh, if you haven't seen Leaflet before, Trust me, you're going to like these, but it's cool. Um, map tools, um, map, oops, map view, and RGBIF, which we're not, I think, maybe we are going to uh, cover that at the end of this tutorial. Let me look down and see what I've got in this lesson. Um, no, no, I think that's the next lesson. Anyway, but uh, we'll load it in here. Maybe we'll just continue on through and do both at once. We shall see. All right, so first off, um, we're going to work with a little bit of vector data. Um, so vector data includes points and polygons. And the vector data is sort of fundamentally different from raster data. Um, vector data has precise locations that are associated with um, a, a real latitude and longitude that is resolvable down to essentially some perfect resolution, at least as far as the shape file is concerned. So we're going to get one right now. We're going to get, uh, uh, ironically, we're going to use a function from the raster package to get some vector data. Uh, the function is called get data. Uh, clever name. Uh, GADM, that was a global administrative data area, something like that. Um, this is just an online repository that raster knows how to access. Uh, country uh, equals España. <laughs> uh, the, there's a, um, these country codes are also online uh, if, you, if you sort of uh, look at the GDA, GADM website. And level equals one, which controls the level of detail. I think this, I think level equals one means like states and country boundaries, but not like counties, municipalities, anything like that. So um, this I think is already in my computer's um, session memory, but you will probably, it might take a minute to download for you. So we now have a polygon. We can actually plot this using R's base plotting. Um, but before you do that, you actually probably want to simplify this polygon. So these polygons are extremely finely detailed. Um, and if you just hit plot on the Spain polygon, uh, you can come back in three hours and see your map, um, which is probably not what you want. So we're going to use this gsimplify function on that object. Uh, desimplify, Spain, and tall is the tolerance. Um, if you want to set it um, coarse, you could. Uh, sorry, we need to do this topology preserve option so that uh, it actually keeps the um, uh, uh, projection right and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so plot this uh, and that looks fine until you zoom in on it and you're going like, oh dear, <laughs> that's not what Spain looks like at all. Um, so that's because we sort of set this tolerance too high. So the lower you set tolerance, the more sort of fine detail will be preserved in this simplified object. And you can actually simplify this object uh, quite a bit, make it a lot smaller, a lot quicker to plot, um, and still actually have a fairly usable level of detail. So I simplified this now using a tolerance of 0.01. Um, and you can see 
this looks pretty reasonable now, um, but it plots in seconds instead of tens of minutes or even hours. So if you're using these uh, uh, GADM shapefiles, highly recommend you simplify a bit first. Um, all right, so we did a plot using R's base plotting. Nice, uh, lets you see what's in there. Um, base plots are really pretty limited in their, in their general functionality though. So they don't typically store into objects easily. They're not very easily modifiable. Um, yeah, and there's not a whole bunch of extensions built on top of them. And so, G uh, yeah, base plots are fine for quick visualizations. For anything serious, I'm going to use a more serious visualization package. And we can use ggplot for this. So uh, ggplot, um, we're going to just plot that polygon. So we're going to tell it, uh, sorry, uh, data equals Spain. And then we need to give it aesthetics. And I just know from Googling that for these GDA, GDM uh, files, uh, this is the way to do this. It's actually not easy to figure out where these variables are stored in this file. But um, yeah, these, poly these big spatial polygons thing that get very... Yeah, so there's really deep nested data structure that's kind of impenetrable. So it's, it's a polygon object that has a bunch of other polygons objects, all of, uh, all of which contain uh, uh, all these different vertices and things like that. And so somewhere deep in that object, there's a variable called long and lat and group, and it's using those to plot. But um, we're not going to dwell on this too much. If we were, if this is going to be a making maps and ggplot course, then maybe we'd do that. But uh, we're going to get to leaflet in just a second, and you will uh, not want to uh, think about ggplot again. And I'm, these are just uh, uh, things to make it a plot a little better. Um, yeah. So this is a ggplot of that same file. It doesn't look that different. It's filled in. Um, it's a little more detailed. Yeah, that's all right. Um, but, you know, what if we want to add some points or something, right? So we don't want to just add plot shape files we find online. So we're going to just make some, some random points in Spain. Actually, let me get rid of this, uh, this theme void here. Um, there we go. So now you can actually see the latitude and longitude. Oh, just so you know what this, uh, cord fix thing is doing. I'm going to get rid of that too. And you see that Spain is suddenly all squished. And that's because it's just trying to fit it to this window as opposed to making uh, uh, the latitudes and longitudes like scale appropriate. So you do this and it looks fine. Okay. So we want to just generate some random points in here. So we're going to do, so our x-axis, that's going to be, we're going to say that's going to be the mean longitude is about zero point, sorry, about three. Yeah, negative three. Yeah. Uh, we'll generate 20 points. Um, mean equals negative three. We're going to an SD of one. And then we're going to do that for the Y axis too. And there, of course, we want it to be the mean Y will be about 40. Sound good? Okay. And then we're going to just uh, turn those into a data frame. So what this is doing is I'm, I'm binding those two columns together into a matrix. And then I'm casting that into a data frame. All right. Or as a data frame, which isn't a thing. So now, there we go. <laughs> uh, so let's look at the, uh, what I just did there. And you'll see, OK, now I've got this data frame column named x, column named y, and those will be points in this space. So let's say we want to add those to this map. Um, we'll just copy and paste, and we'll do some modifications here. Uh, yeah, group equals group. We're going to set the alpha here. So that makes it slightly transparent. Uh, we're going to set our theme back to void. 
Um, and we will. Oops. Ah. All right. So we're going to tell them the data for our point layer is at points data frame. Our aesthetics x equals x, y equals y. And this is telling it the x axis is this x column, the y axis is this y column. And there we go. So we've got this little map. It's now gray because this alpha value is, is set to 0.5. Uh, we can suppress that legend if we want to, but like I say, we're not going to get too deep into mapping with ggplot because it's just not worth it. Um, so we've got Spain. We've got some data points. Cool. So this is all vector data. So um, that's, you know, lines, polygons, points. Those are all vector data, things that have very precise locations. Um, a lot of what we use in species distribution modeling is actually raster data, though. So we actually often don't even end up using these polygons or lines very much. Most of our stuff ends up being points and rasters. Um, and there's this saying that it helps you remember the sort of general attributes of each. Vector is corrector, <laughs> but raster is faster. So what that means is uh, uh, the locations of things in a vector data layer is precise. So there is a very precise longitude and latitude that corresponds to this point. And you can zoom in as much as you want, and that point is still going to be exactly where it is. Uh, um, and is it's like in any attribute that is affixed to that point is going to be located at that exact spot in space. Whereas rasters are these sort of grids of, uh, uh, um, of values that are tend to be like sort of spread out over a square uh, uh, region. I'll show you what I mean in just a second. So we'll, we're going to get some environmental data. Again, we're going to use this raster get data function. Snip five bar equals T max. So this is a maximum temperature um, res equals 2.5 um, model equals AC year equals 2070, RCP equals 85. Now, I already had that stored locally, so it just loaded immediately for me. For you, it may take a few minutes to actually download this data because it's getting data from uh, um, UC Davis, uh, my alma mater, in fact. We'll use some base plots on this real quick just so you can see what this looks like. So we're, uh, this, one second. So in is actually a list of rasters. And there's 12 of them because this is monthly maximum temperatures um, under this model. So we're just going to plot the January maximum temperature just so you can see what this looks like using base plotting. Eventually. Okay, there we go. All right, so that's the whole world. Um, we don't really need the whole world. So we could do, um, we could actually clip this using our, or crop this using our uh, Spain polygon there, uh, using the crop function. And so what that does is actually uses, well, you'll see what it does in a second. Uh, it uses our Spain layer to crop our environment layer. But it's worth noting, it's actually just using the extent. Oops, uh, I should have just done the first layer. Oh, well. But it's actually just using the extent of our Spain layer, not uh, the, the uh, boundaries of the polygons themselves. Um, we'll zoom in on one of these in just a second when this gets done plotting. So we'll just uh, look at this first one here. Yeah, so you notice this is set so the, the, the boundaries look like our uh, polygon. So we had our polygon, we had Spain here, 
and then we had uh, the Canaries down here, but we didn't have uh, the northern northwestern chunk of Africa in that polygon. But basically, it just takes the minimum and maximum limits of our polygon uh, and uses that to crop the uh, um, uh, the the raster layer. Okay. If we wanted uh, to actually sort of file that down manually to something that's a little more usable, we could actually de define an extent using this extent function. And for that, we need the lower left corner uh, um, x uh, and the, um, see, basically, okay, we need the x min, x max, y min, y max in that order. So we'll do negative 10, right? This, Negative 10. So we just want this little area up here. So we have negative 10. I know I'll say like 4. Because that's the x max. And for the y min, we'll do say 35. Y max is 45. Right? And then we can do in prop x equals m y equals spin dot. And then uh, uh, there you go. So that's actually just cropped to our bounding box that we just uh, defined with the extent function. And um, yeah, that's cool. Uh, so let's actually take, uh, uh, see if we can figure out what this is doing here. We'll wait just a second. So what I did is I took the maximum from this stack, this, this list of environmental rasters, um, and assigned that to Tmax. So Tmax is now a single raster layer. What this did is it actually just took the month with the hottest overall value. This did not go grid cell by grid cell to get the maximum in each grid cell. It didn't even necessarily take the month with the hottest average temperature. It just took, um, it gave us the whole raster for the month with the highest overall temperature. Yeah, so uh, if we wanted to just check that out, there you go. All right. Now, I'm plotting rasters here using base plotting. Um, I'm going to show you how to do this with ggplot. Um, it's it's a, a little janky, but it's not too bad. Um, the thing about ggplot is it kind of mainly likes to work with data frames. So the easiest way that I know of to plot this in ggplot is to actually convert this raster to a data frame and then plot it back into ggplot as a raster. That sounds like a lot more work than it is. Uh, I'll show you real quick. So we'll do a tmax data frame as data frame tmax. Let's just do this real quick so you can see it, tmax.vf. Uh, that only has the values from the raster. It actually didn't have the x and y. So what we need to do is actually do xy equals true. And so just to look at this head of the Tmax data frame, we've got X and Y, so it coordinates for every grid cell here. And then whether or not they're in A or the value for that Tmax layer if it's not in A. Okay, so now we've got a data frame. We can plot this using ggplot. <coughs> and we use geom raster. Theta equals tmax.ef. Aesthetics, x equals x, because we have an x column here. y equals y. Fill equals layer. So we're telling it to fill uh, uh, each grid cell with colors that are proportional to the value in uh, this layer thing. Okay, so let's just do this as is. All right, that worked, except that it's squashed. It's kind of an ugly color ramp. Uh, we can deal with some of that. We can make it e the coordinates equal. Um, yep, 
Okay. Um, theme void, just to get rid of that gray back, oh, sorry, that um, grid background. Plus, um, we're going to recolor this, um, and we're going to do scale, fill, continuous. I'll say the low value is dark blue. So that's low temperatures are going to be dark blue. Uh, high is going to be red. Uh, guide equals color bar. In a value equals white. There you go. Uh, it's a bit of a garish color scheme, but that's not too bad, right? So you've got uh, uh, low temperatures are blue, high temperatures are red. Um, you've got it essentially scaled so that it looks like Spain. You get this nice white background. Yeah, not so bad. Okay. But Screw all that, we're going to use Leaflet. Leaflet is specifically for making maps and is one of my favorite things I've discovered in R in recent years. It's just really nice. And you notice how when we were using ggplot, I was sort of starting out by creating an empty ggplot object. Uh, Leaflet kind of works that way too. So we're going to create, we're going to create a map that's just called M. And it's now just a leaflet object. And that doesn't do anything at all. It gives us a plus and a minus here and nothing. OK, so we have to add stuff to this. Um, and there's all these functions uh, that work with these leaflet objects. So now we're going to take um, uh, uh, that M map and we're going to add tiles. So tiles is sort of background maps in leaflet speak. Um, and so we're going to pass our existing leaflet object into this add tiles function, and then we're going to store that back in M. Okay. So what did I just do there? Well, now I have a map of the world, because I, I added the tiles for the world, stored in that M object. And you can actually zoom in and, uh, you know, pan around and all that sort of stuff. And I got all that from one uh, uh, well, two commands here. Okay. But we can do a lot more than that, obviously. So we're going to add a marker uh, to M. So you, with these leaflet functions, you always pass in the, an existing map first, basically. Uh, so I'm going to, I just know these because I looked them up. Uh, 381, 8491, uh, 1. Yep, 2.182865. And this is actually my favorite uh, tapas restaurant in Barcelona. I don't know why. It's just when I think of things in Spain, it comes to mind almost immediately. All right. So what I've done here is to that existing map, I've added a marker at latitude this, longitude that, and I've labeled it Ken Paishano. And you're like, where's the label? Well, it shows up when you hover over it. And the thing is, once you do that, and you actually you type M to display your map, um, uh, it sort of auto zooms to what it thinks is a reasonable level given the features that are on your map. But you can still zoom way out and it will automatically reduce the level of detail so that your map isn't too cluttered. And we can look at where Ken Paishano is in relation to the world, um, etc. Very nice, right? And again, that's a super cool map. It looks so much nicer than that ggplot uh, uh, or base plot stuff. And it took this little effort. But there is so much more. Um, so we have add markers here. We can instead. Um, do this. I'm just going to copy this because the next thing I'm going to show you is most of the same um, stuff. There's different ways to uh, annotate these maps. You can also do add, uh, what is it, add pop ups. And then this is no longer a label, this is pop up. 
So what's that do? Similar, but now we've got this little like a uh, balloon kind of thing that says where Karen Paisano is. Um, we can also manually add uh, circles where we want to. So we could say uh, M is Leafla. Add tile. Um, and we could say M is add circles, M. And we need to uh, um, provide some X coordinates and some Y coordinates. So we can actually just use the stuff from our points uh, uh, X and points uh, Y. So now we have little circular markers everywhere where we uh, um, uh, uh, simulated our species, which you can even call that a simulation. Um, yeah. You can also, so let's do uh, uh, um, something slightly different. Let's, uh, gonna just create this thing called corners.lap. We'll see what I'm doing here in a second. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm basically going to draw a box. All right, so these blue dots here, those are what I was just drawing. So one of these is at, uh, let's say, what we've got uh, uh, latitude, so this latitude 41.2, longitude 2.1, latitude 41.2, longitude 2.2, latitude 41.4, longitude 2.2, uh, latitude 41.4, longitude 2.1. So we've got this little box here. So what, right? Okay. Uh, well, we can do this. Uh, we can actually do M and we can add polygons. And so this actually allows us to specify an ordered set of X coordinates and an ordered set of Y coordinates. And we can draw any arbitrary shape we want that, um, which is really cool. It's it's a, a, a sometimes very useful to be able to just say, okay, uh, uh, I want to draw a pentagon here or something like that. And it's, it's really easy in Leaflet. And again, looks super nice for the amount of work it is, right? You can zoom, you can pan, you can do whatever you want. All right. So we don't actually have to build polygons manually, though. We can uh, actually add the ones we've already got. Uh, so we're going to use this function called add polygons. And data equals Spain. So that's our shape file from above. Um, color equals black. Fill color, I'll get to the difference in a second, and we're going to just use this color amp. So, uh, right, okay. I'll, I'm going to type this out and then I'll explain.
Isn't that beautiful? Okay. <laughs> so color for a polygon here refers to the lines that outline the polygon. Fill color is the colors inside uh, uh, of each polygon. And so what I've done here is I've used heat.colors to generate, uh, this, is a, this basically generates a palette. And I, since we have 14 uh, states here, I generated 14 colors from that palette. Alpha equals null means are not transparent, I guess. Um, yeah, so there we go. We've got a map. We've got, uh, um, hold on a second, I'll redraw. Uh, we've got polygons. We've got the base map behind it. It's just very neat. And you can add point data in front of it and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it's extremely cool. And you'll see in a few minutes, well, I guess a few hours, that we use this in ENM tools all the time. Now, something that's worth knowing is we've, we've just been saying add tiles and that's it. And that gives us a default tile set, which is pretty useful. But there's a bunch of other tile sets that are not the default. Um, so if you go to this URL, which is provided uh, here, or is also in the, the tutorial here, um, if, you, if you have the R markdown file for this, uh, if you go to this URL, you will find along the right hand side here, a whole bunch of tile sets that you can use. Um, it's important to know that these are being retrieved from online uh, whenever you use them. And as such, uh, uh, sometimes they can be slow. You need an internet connection to be able to pan and zoom your map and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but also some of these providers are a little spotty and sometimes uh, a few of these don't always work. I've had really good luck with Stamen. Uh, these almost always seem to be online and uh, 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 download really quickly, but there's so much other stuff. And there's a few of these. I think the Esri ones you actually need like an API key for or something like that. Uh, I, I can't recall, but there are definitely a few of these where you at least used to need an API key. But you have a lot of options here for a set of base tiles. And it allows you a great deal of flexibility in customizing what your map looks like. So, yeah, I highly recommend you poke around there a little bit. It's a lot of fun to sort of replot your data using a bunch of different uh, uh, options just to sort of uh, see what it looks like. So if we wanted to use some of those, we'd just say uh, create our em empty leaflet object. And instead of add tiles, we say add provider tiles to M. We, we always pass, pass in our existing object first. And now we'll say provider equals, uh, and these are just the names. So I should have actually kept this up here to show you this. These here, that's the names of these different tile sets. So you would basically just plug those words in there if you wanted that tile set as your tile set. And so I'm going to use one here real quick called a stamen dot watercolor. Take a minute. Okay. And then to view it again, we have to actually type the name of our thing. And it's this really pretty like watercolor painting map of the world. Beautiful. And it's great because as you zoom in, you know, it sort of resolves to a finer and finer uh, scale watercolor painting of, of, of your area, right? It's just really neat. Let's look at these islands here. Let's see how far down we can get before it's just a painting. Yeah, so we're just getting more and more and more detail. We're going all the way down to roads um, and rivers and forests and things. And it's just lovely. <laughs> I'm just amusing myself now, as you can probably guess. Anyway, as you can tell, it's a beautiful map. Um, yeah. And so now we can actually add some data to that. I'm going to just copy and paste this code here um, from the tutorial, if I can. Let's 
So I'm going to create an object over here called green leaf icon using this function called make icon. And for that, you pass in um, a URL or a local path to a file, um, the size you want it, uh, uh, how it anchors in respect to the, with respect to the um, uh, location within the file, like what, what essentially what part of the image you're loading in do you want to be where the latitude and longitude is. Um, and you can actually even add a shadow and all that sort of stuff. So I just loaded all that in. Now, if we wanted to, we're going to take our existing like watercolor map there and use add markers M. Um, I'm just going to copy in this latitude mod to Ken Pachano. Uh, boom. Okay, and now we're going to say icon equals green leaf icon. So that's this thing we created up here. So we made an object that's this icon, and now we're going to use that as the icon for our thing. And when we do that, we see now the location of Ken Paishano is given by this lovely little green uh, uh, twig, right? A little twig with a green leaf on it, very pretty. Um, there we go, we can zoom out and the icon stays the same size, which is interesting. Yeah, pretty neat. Now, if you want to export this, and save it somewhere. You can actually do, if you want it to be dynamic, Hannibal, Zim, all that sort of stuff, you can do uh, save as web page. And it will actually save. Let's see, let me get to do this here. Just gonna save it as a thing called test. So it's saved. Um, here we go. Uh, it's saved an HTML file called test. And if I open that up, in my web browser, drag it over here. I now have a, uh, a, a panable, zoomable version of my map um, that's loadable from an HTML file. It's pretty great. But maybe you don't want an HTML file. Maybe you want like a, a, a static image. Um, you can do that. Unfortunately, I think I have not figured out how to render these as vector graphics yet, which is unfortunate because I prefer vector graphics for publication. But um, yeah, there may be a way to do that that I just haven't learned yet. Um, so for this, we're actually going to need a, a, a bit of a special thing. Um, so we're going to have to use this package called WebShot, which you'll have to install if you don't have it already. Install Phantom JavaScript. And I already have it installed, so it just said, yeah, you're fine, whatever. Um, but we can use that for this package called MapShot, which we've already loaded. So it's a MapShot of the file M, or the object M. So the file equals mymap.png. Oops, I'm sorry, that should be in quotes because it's a file name. Take a second. Well, I have one that I prepared earlier. <laughs> I don't know why that took a while to export. Oh, there we go. And you've got a nice PNG of your map there. Um, it is worth noting that uh, uh, some of these uh, tile sets, maybe even all of them, actually come with attribution. So if you're going to be using these in a paper or a website or whatever, you should make sure to cite the source of your tile sets. Um, but you can do the same thing for P PDFs. So um, map shot. So that's very handy. Where's 
из нашей страницы. Right. Well, here we go. That one's right here. Just to show you, you can open it in the PDF or save it as PDF. Uh, all right. Cool. And there's a bunch of little add ons. You can add a scale bar if you want. Now this tells us that, you know, this is 300 meters or 1,000 feet. And the great thing about the scale bar is it changes as you zoom in and out, right? It's, it's a dynamic scale bar. That is really clever. Um, you can add graticules, um, which is a, like a grid, latitudes and longitudes. And now you don't see it right away because we're so zoomed in, but if you zoom out far enough, you will start to see we have uh, grid uh, marks for the, the globe. So uh, it's uh, this interval equals two means every second uh, lat or long. So it's just an even number lat and long. Uh, um, All right, so this is great for just sort of plotting some simple data. Uh, but we have, like I said earlier, like our stuff is uh, often rasters. So you can add rasters really easily too. So we're going to create a new leaflet object. Um, we're going to use one called stamen.toner. It's a black and white map. Let's look at that real quick just so you can see it. Very dramatic looking. All right. Um, so for uh, uh, adding raster, so we can just do add raster image to M. We're going to add um, uh, the August high temperature, and we're going to give it a sixty percent uh, opacity. And then we'll look at it. And there you go. It added our raster image. It even gave us a default color ramp, which isn't too terrible. And so, uh, um, yeah. I think this is actually, I think it's actually scaled backwards, though, so that uh, uh, the redder colors are actually colder and the uh, uh, bluer colors are actually warmer. Uh, I'm sure we can reverse that. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of options to poke around in to figure that out. Uh, we can actually add our own um, uh, color ramp. Um, it's a little bit of a pain in the butt, but uh, not too terrible. The thing about it is it kind of wants a function as a palette as opposed to just a list of colors. So yeah, it gets a little weird. So now we're going to create the palette. Here we're, we're, we're specifying uh, hex values manually, um, which is not technically how I do this, but just to show you that you can. Okay, so we are generating a color ramp here. It's got like a low color, a mid color, and a high color. And we're saying map that, those, that, that color ramp 
to the values in uh, uh, the August temperature. So this is inv8 is our uh, uh, Tmax layer for August. And then we're saying if you get any NAs, which we have a lot of, uh, make those transparent. And so all this information, whoops. I think I need one more zero there. Yes. All right. Yes. All this information is being stored in this PAL uh, uh, function. Hold on, let me just see. You see, it's actually got a, a, a function definition here. So when call PAL later with a value, it will return a color value. So right now, M just looks like that. So we're going to add master image to M colors equals pal. Uh, data is in capacity equals 0 0.6. And there we go. So now we've got blue in the coldest spots, yellow for sort of the middle. So these are the colors we define here. And then red for the uh, uh, hottest places. And then we can do stuff like uh, um, adding a legend. So now we've got our legend here, essentially showing us what these values actually mean. And it sort of stays where it is, even when we pan and zoom and all that sort of stuff. Now there's an interesting thing you can do here if you want. What if you don't want all these shapes or anything like that? You can actually create a leaflet object where you the tiles just have names of places as opposed to um, uh, uh, their actual outlines. So we could actually do um, leaflet. I'm just going to copy this from up here. Actually, we will just leave it as is, actually. So notice I haven't added any tiles here. I can just go ahead and uh, add raster image. I'm going to to be fully opaque now since it's just kind of on its own. There we go. We got a lovely raster image. And we can zoom and pan on our own raster image just like we did in those base tiles. Now, if we want, notice none of our places are, are labeled. I said we're going to label places. Uh, we can actually do that. Arto db dot positron only label. So this is a tile set that only consists uh, of labels for places. And so now we have our raster, but we have cities labeled. And it's again, it's zoomable. You get more detail the further in you get. Right, so you see new uh, towns and regions appearing as we get closer and closer. In. So you might wonder why I added the raster image first and the tiles second. I'll show you real quick. Um, one of the interesting things about Leaflet, and it's worth being aware of, is that uh, it's ggplot works this way too. Stuff you add first is actually under stuff you add later. So if I was to add those tiles first, and then add the raster image, 
Notice that you see the, the labels for everything that's outside of the raster. And you can actually see that it's layered over the labels for stuff um, <laughs> as we zoom in. So it's important to add things from the bottom up in terms of how you want to see them. And just to show you how pretty you can make stuff, I wanna, I, I've always, I just love showing you this because it's just pretty. Um, So I'm getting some from NASA, Earth at night, 2012. So the background here is a, a satellite um, imagery that NASA took of the Earth at night that essentially shows where there's more light on the surface and where there's less. So you can see, actually, as we zoom in here, you'll see more and more. Where there are cities, you've got a lot of light. You can see all these little tiny towns. And then these, uh, the, the lines are actually railway maps from another tile set. Just kind of really pretty uh, color scheme, kind of reminds me of Starry Night. <laughs> yeah. It's just lovely. Okay, uh, so now that we've seen some kind of basic mapping, um, let's do some stuff that's a little more practical. Just get through a couple of bits of data manipulation that, that are, are probably going to come in handy at some point during the course. Um, let's go ahead and get the uh, bioclim variables from uh, WorldClim. Use that raster get data function again. Tell it to get the WorldClim variables this time. Uh, resolution equals. 10 minutes, um, var equals bio. Okay, and yours, again, may take a minute, um, but, uh, uh, sorry, mine was already sort of stored locally, so, yeah. Look at this uh, object we've done. We've got a raster stack. It's, uh, these are essentially the dimensions of it. Uh, it's 19 layers. Uh, this is a number of rows, number of columns, total number of cells, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we can plot, using base plotting, the first layer. Look at it. All right, there we go. This is just showing you the first bioclim layer worldwide. Obviously, we need to just uh, crop that down. So we're going to do Spain.worldclim as a crop. Um, All.worldclim using Spain.extent. Kind of choking on something right now. Hold on a second. There we go. 
All right, so what is the first biochemical layer? Let me just look it up. I think it's temperature, mean temperature. Uh, Second, yeah, annual mean temperature. Cool. Um, so let's go ahead and get this into a, a leaflet thing. I want to show you another cool trick here. When we start, when we start working with large data sets, this can be really handy. Uh, so I'm passing in. This is something we didn't really do before. Uh, um, I'm passing in the points data frame to leaflet. And you might ask why I'm doing that. So what that does actually, it tells Leaflet uh, that, that this points data frame is actually sort of attached to this, to this map that we're building. And if I tell it to, you know, something about some variables, uh, um, it will assume they're in this points data unless told otherwise. So uh, I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. Um, we'll add some tiles first. Um, Let's just look at that real quick. So there's that. Um, we're going to add some markers for our points as we did before. And now we're going to add a new a new uh, uh, thing here, which is pretty cool. Uh, so, we did a few things here. So, we used add circle markers on M, uh, and we said longitude is a function of X. And that's actually why we, uh, we can get away with that, because we passed uh, uh, this into... Hold on. So we passed the points data frame into the original leaflet thing, so points is now attached to M. So I can say longitude is a function of X, and it knows that this is going to be X variable in that points data frame. And latitude is going to be a function of Y, which it knows refers to that data frame. So you can just... if you create a leaflet object with a particular data source built into it, uh, then you can just refer to variables from that data source without uh, um, having to refer to the data source directly. And uh, um, yeah, it's just a little bit easier. But notice what happened with our points here. We, uh, uh, we're zoomed out now. And so for our 20 data points, it says there are seven in this general area and 13 in this general area, instead of showing us all of them. And then as we zoom in, it sort of splits them out and says, okay, there's one point over here. There's seven here, ten here, two here. And then we zoom in, four, seven, two. You see what it's doing? It's essentially giving us as much detail as it thinks it can comfortably plot at a certain zoom level. And then as we zoom further in, it's spreading those things out, and eventually we'll show you the exact location of things. Now, this looks fine with all 20 points displayed on it. Uh, wasn't a big deal. But when you have a data set with, you know, a thousand data points in it, it's going to look quite, uh, yeah, quite messy uh, if you don't do something like this. And Leaflet makes it nice and easy. So, yeah, it's just a nice little option to know about. Cool. All right. And so some of you who are more experienced in R may have noticed that um, each one of these functions requires the existing Leaflet object as its first argument. Which, if you're, you know, experienced in the tidyverse, probably says to you these functions are designed specifically to work with uh, the pipe operator from DeepLayer. If you don't know what that means, no worries. I'll show you. It's just a way of making your code a little bit cleaner in some situations. So now, I'm going to so m equals leaflet. Basically, just redo what I just did there. 
But now I'm going to use this thing called the pipe operator. So that's percent uh, uh, greater than percent. And now I'm going to call the next argument. And then the next argument with another pipe operator. Not image, innate. Uh, um, Now this, I'm just gonna go ahead and clear this out so you can see that I'm not lying here. Uh, this turns out to make the exact same map as before. But this pipe operator, uh, basically it's this thing from the dplyr package. So if you don't already have that, that's library. dplyr, um, you may have to install it first. What this does is this operator here says, take the output of this thing and put it in as the first argument to this thing. So you notice up here, we had to pass each of these functions m uh, as the first argument. Using the pipe operator, we don't have to pass the, the, the map along anymore because it happens automatically. So let's say, okay, do leaflet on points, pass that in to add provider tiles, and then the second argument actually is provider stamen and toner, blah, blah, blah. The first argument is whatever came in for, through the pipe. And so then it's like, okay, take that map and put it in the pipe to add raster image. And then the first argument it gets is actually what comes out of this pipe. And then the rest of the arguments are here. And then pass that into add circle markers. And so this way you can, with a single sort of nested command, say, okay, call this function, put the output of that into this function, put the output of that into this function, put the output of that into this function. And when you're done with all that, pass it back out to this M thing. And it's, Again, just a way to make your code look a little neater. It works exactly the same. Uh, it takes, working with a pipe uh, operator takes a little while to get used to, but it's worth it um, quite often. There are some cases where it actually makes things more confusing, uh, but it, there's a lot of cases where it actually makes your code look a lot cleaner. So um, that's just showing you, you can use leaflet with the pipe from dplyr if you want to. Okay. So we've got some occurrence points, right? What if we actually want um, values from our environmental layers at our occurrence points, right? So we can use this function called extract from the raster package. We can extract from spain.worldclim at our occurrence points. What do we see here? So we have like 20 occurrence points. And now we've got 20 rows and 19 columns because we have 19 bioclim layers. So we now have one row for each of our occurrence points and then the value of every one of those 19 layers at that uh, occurrence point. So obviously that can be useful for modeling. But we don't have our latitudes and longitudes here. So we can actually do in.points is a more column bind our points to in dot points. And now we'll look at in dot points again. So now it looks the same except we've got latitudes and longitudes. So we have the x values, the y values, and then all the environmental variables there. It's very nice. Often for modeling, we need background points. We can actually do this using the sample random function. So bg.points, sample randomly, oops, sample random, 
uh, from Spain.worldclin. XY equals true, and this is because we want latitudes and longitudes to these points. Size equals 1,000. That's actually the number of points you're trying to sample. And there we go. We're just going to look at the head of this data frame because it's going to be big. So now we have a data frame for 10,000 randomly chosen points from uh, uh, this Spain.worldquin region. Uh, and the values of all those environmental layers at those points. Now we are going to want to show those points on a map. Um, to do that, uh, it's worth noting, one second, uh, background points here is just a, is it a data frame? Hold on a second. Uh, I think I, I jumped ahead here. Yeah, so the matrix uh, is what comes out of there. Um, it doesn't look any different from the data frame, but you actually need to convert it to a data frame um, to uh, use it with a leaflet. It doesn't like matrices. So background points is as data frame background up. Yeah, all right. So now we can actually just uh, copy and paste this code. We're just gonna use this and we're just gonna pass in the background points instead of the occurrence points. I think that will work. Yes, and so here's where you really see the value of that uh, cluster thing. It's like, we've got a lot of points here and it's still a pretty clean map. It, and it even gives you like a little polygon that says in this region there's 263 points, in this region there's 153 points. Uh, I'll just show you real quick what it looks like without that. Um, yeah, it's a bit of chaos. Uh, so that's obviously not something you really want to send to someone and have them be able to interpret at a kind of a broad geographic scale like that. It's just a bit gross. All right, so uh, yeah, let's go back to this. So if we wanted to actually build a model by hand, which we're using E&M tools, so we don't have to, we are cooler than that, um, uh, we could actually turn this uh, background points and our presence points into a data frame that we could use for modeling. To do that, what do we have? So we have points, uh, this is the Sorry, uh, it's our end dot points. I think that's what we have, right? Yeah, so this is the uh, X, Y's and the values at our data points, uh, our occurrence points. Um, and then we have uh, our uh, background points, same thing. We want to stitch these together into a data frame for modeling. What's missing? Um, so what we would actually need is a response variable, right? Because we've got latitude and longitude, and we've got all of our environmental predictors, but we don't have a response variable. So our response variable is presence versus absence, right? So we need to make a column for that. So we'll first we'll just make that the vector. I'm going to create a vector called PA, and we're going to concatenate uh, a bunch of ones. and a bunch of zeros. So I'll explain what I'm doing here in just a second. So what I've done here is I've said, okay, stitch together. We're gonna to make as many ones as we have rows in our environmental points data frame, our, our occurrence data, right? So we need ones for the rows where we have occurrence data, and we need zeros for the rows where we have background points. So we, now we have this vector called PA, that's just a bunch of ones and zeros. So we are going to bind together by row our occurrence data and our, our presence data and our background data. So we're going to pa.m.points is r bind m.points and bg. I don't know why I called one of those points down on PTS. So now this is uh, our occurrences, our presences, and our background data together, but we need to add on our PA vector here too. So we could do pa.env.points uh, is cbind, pa.env 
dot points um, with PA. So we're now in our stitching this vector here of presences and absences or presences and backgrounds onto our environmental data. So let's do the uh, head of PA dot in dot points so you can see what I mean. So now we have uh, lat long, a bunch of environmental variables, and this variable for presence and absence, or presence and background. If we want to, we can actually use this real quick to um, do a ggplot, and uh, we'll say data equals pa dot in dot points. Uh, aesthetics x equals bio1 fill equals as factor PA plus geom histogram then width equals 2 alpha equals 0 0.5 All right, so what we've done here, just to show you, is I passed in my PA inf points layer. I told it to plot the, on the x-axis bio one, but then to fill these bars using P presence absence as a factor or presence background. So the blue here represents the uh, uh, values for bioclim one where my species uh, occurs. I mean, species in this case is just those random points I made up, obviously. Uh, but the uh, uh, pink represents the background data. It's often very, I think, useful and interesting to visualize your data this way, just so you can see what your um, uh, model is trying to do. Because as we'll talk about uh, uh, or uh, in the GLM um, thing, what your model is often trying to do, if you're talking about presence background modeling, is it's trying to come up with a function that distinguishes this distribution from that distribution. And in this case, you can see that's going to be quite challenging because this is all randomly chosen data. I mentioned earlier that uh, I would show you what Plotly does. I'll just do this, I'll just do this real quick. Um, let's say um, my hist, and we'll just basically put this plot we just made into an object called my hist. And then from Plotly, we can actually call this thing called ggplotly. Uh, my.hist. And what you'll get is something that initially looks exactly like what we just had. Until you mouse over it and you see you've got all these controls now, right? Let's zoom in on this. Okay, it's not showing me the things. Okay. Ah, there they are. I think it just took a minute to load. So now we actually we can mouse over this stuff and we can actually see details on what our actual data is here what the actual counts are for each of these bars. We can zoom into our plot if we wanted to. <laughs> it's not the most useful with this plot, but uh, there you go. And reset axes. Just we have a bunch of little thing, you know, like a I don't know what selecting the data like that does, honestly. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it just gives us a bun, uh, the ability to sort of explore our plots a little more. I'm not sure the lasso is very useful for us right now, but some of these other things could be. Uh, and then you can download the plot as a PNG and all that sort of stuff. So uh, um, Plotly uh, can be quite nice, uh, particularly if you're actually doing all your stuff in R Markdown, which I highly recommend. Doing your plots uh, uh, using ggplotly and uh, doing your maps using Leaflet just makes your, your HTML output from our markdown files so much more dynamic and uh, uh, interactive and it really takes very little work. Um, so yeah, it's cool. All right, we're going to do one more thing, I think. Yeah. Let's say we want, uh, so we have, um, let's do a base plot here. Uh, uh, Spain, that world clim one. Um, 
add our points on there, right? What if we want a range map from that? We can actually do that using, oh, I don't think I actually had this one at the top. We can use um, a library called ADE Habitat HR. And we can use this to make a range map shape from our occurrence data. So we can do points dot L O C O H. That stands for localized convex hole. That's I'm just naming it this to remind me that this is a localized convex hole. And then we're going to actually use the loco um, K function. Um, we're going to convert these. Uh, points to spatial points on the fly here. It's just what this function wants. Um, K equals eight. Uh, that actually sort of controls how convoluted the polygon you're making is. Um, yeah. And so uh, let's uh, plot Spain dot world clown one now. Um, oh right, we want to do. But this points.loco thing, it actually, uh, it spits out a whole bunch of like little sub polygons that we typically don't want for a range map. So we're going to dissolve those. Uh, we're going to call this points.loco.dissolve. We use union spatial polygons. Polygons has a Y in it, not a U. There we go. Locho. Um, yeah. Now plot the thing more than one. Plot points dot. That was all. So now we are plotting the little range map we just made as a red polygon. Pretty fancy. And we can add our points on there just so you can see what it's done here. Um, colored in blue, and for plot character, we'll use 16, which is just solid dots. Ta da! Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> um, yeah. Of course, we can do the same thing in leaflet, and it will look much nicer. Um, and we're going to now pass in this points loco dissolved um, as one of the arguments when we create our initial thing so that it, uh, leaflet knows that we're talking about this data when we uh, do some stuff in just a minute. Um, add provider tiles. Uh, And now we're we're going to use the dplyr approach. Let's pipe it to uh, add raster image uh, Spain world one. one. Opacity And now we're just going to type add polygons. And uh, yeah, let it do its thing. And when I said add polygons, uh, that was part of the reason to pass this in here, is when I say add polygons, it knows, uh, oh, I already know about some polygons. I'm just going to add the ones you sent me. Yeah? So that's pretty cool. And we can add our circular markers here for our occurrences if we want to. But uh, yeah, there we go. So what if we decided this was our species range and we wanted to sample some points from here for modeling instead of sampling the entirety of our background? We can do that uh, by sampling for, uh, using the uh, sp sample function. Whole.points is uh, sp sample. Let's go from the sp package. Let's to local dissolved in equals a thousand type equals random
You can see those are spatial points. Um, so they already have like a, a, a projection information stuff like that attached to them. Um, well, at least in the formatting, I don't know if they actually do. Also. So uh, just to see what those look like, we'll plot uh, Spain.worldclim uh, first layer again, and we'll add Okay. So those are our thousand points sampled from within that polygon. Uh, beautiful, right? If we want to sample our environmental variables from those points, it's slightly different because if you look inside this uh, whole lot points object, uh, there's it's a spatial points object, and so there's different stuff in there. And the actual x and y coordinates are stored in whole dot points uh, at chords. And that's our actual x and y's. So uh, if we went to uh, <clears throat> our environmental variables there, it's, it's the same as above, except we do c bind uh, whole dot points, oops, whole dot points at chords. And then we're going to just c bind that to uh, the extracted values from Spain.worldclim um, at the coordinates in our holdup points on there. Yeah. There we go. So you can see we've again got our x's and y's. We've got the values of our bioclim variables, and then we've got uh, uh, we've got these values now are from these data points that are drawn from within that localized convex hole um, around the species uh, uh, occurrence points. Um, now we can essentially do what we did above. Um, Hole.pa So our presence uh, uh, points for our, our presence, absence, or presence background sampling, and in our background, which is a zero, yeah, okay. We're going to bind to get our bind together the rows of our um, environment of our uh, point data, our occurrence data with our background data, and then we are going to C bind on our uh, presence. So what we've done is we've essentially just created, yet again, a data frame where we've got x and y, we've got the values for all our bioclip variables, and we've got this column for uh, presence absence. Uh, just to show you, uh, I'm only showing the first six rows here using head, uh, and of course the first six are our occurrences, but if you look at the end, at the bottom of the thing, uh, you can tail, you can see the, the, the last values in there are zeros, so, you know, there are ones and zeros in that presence absence data frame. And uh, yeah, uh, if we want to use ggplot or leaflet or whatever on this, uh, we're going to need to create, uh, sorry, uh, cast to a data frame as data. Frame. Yeah, and now we can uh, ggplot this.
Well, it's taking its sweet time. There we go. Yeah, so now we have the distribution of our uh, fake key occurrence points along this bio one axis and the distribution of the background along that bio one axis. And uh, there you go. So yeah, those are just, I think, some of the most important uh, uh, functions you're gonna need for you know extracting data and plotting it and things like that. Um, again, this is, you know, just hopefully given what this course is supposed to be, this stuff is, is mostly review for you. Uh, hopefully you saw a few new tricks, um, but if not, uh, congratulations, you probably know a lot about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, more than anything else, this is just kind of a, a, a swift tour of the sorts of things you can do and uh, sorts of things you might want to do or need to do, uh, both to build the models and to visualize the models that we're going to be um, creating in the rest of this course. All right.